Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Locked On Flames. Today, we are doing another crossover, this time with Locked On Kraken, and we are going to get Kraken on their much different roster. Your Locked On Flames, your daily podcast on the Calgary Flames, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, hello, everyone. I hope you're having a great day today. As always, you can check out Locked on Flames on uh, wherever you get your podcasts. But today I have a very special guest, Erica Ayala. How are you today? Hey, I'm doing all right. How are you? Oh, I'm great. I'm very jealous that you're somewhere with some palm trees and just soaking up the sun. It's like a hundred billion degrees out with the humidity and it's cloudy. So I'm just not, uh, not soaking up the sun. Hey, you know, we got to live the life because once <laughs> hockey season comes, winter's <laughs> not my favorite. So, no. uh, I don't want to be holed up, but yeah, I'm in Florida doing some NWSL stuff and broadcasting, but also of course, got to do the locked on oh, you know now we're at three times a week so we got a little vacay <laughs> <laughs> right you can space it out a little bit and actually have like two days to yourself where you're not constantly on with hockey but I figured today we could kind of chat about some changes and what's what the future of the Kraken looks like um mainly because this entire roster looked so different, even at the trade deadline. But now we're in like, I guess like the first true off season for the Kraken. How, yeah. how are things looking? How are, how do you feel about it? So I think I'm feeling a little bit better, but considering that I have said on Locked on Kraken a bunch of times, we kind of needed everything. I think there was still um, a lot that we could have gone for. I think ultimately with the cap space and even the prospects, more so the draft picks that we had, I think we went more of a conservative route. And I do think a lot of that has to do with getting Shane Wright at number four. Yeah. How? What was your reaction to that? That, you know – huge get with him huge get and if I'm being honest I hadn't done a lot of scouting uh before the draft on Shane Wright because everything that we were hearing was that he was going number one and so there's not that many scenarios that I had drawn up in my mind where he would fall to four Uh, and I just didn't think that we were going to be able to jockey for position higher than four so of course I knew about Shane Wright heard a lot of great things about him but never really um, did a deep dive into what he could be for the Seattle Kraken squad and of course that changed very quickly (laughs) on draft day I was in Chicago getting ready for the WNBA All-Star Weekend and I was like okay I I better hop on a cell device or something and and patch into Kraken Nation because my goodness what a pick so um yeah that was a wild wild draft we've talked a lot on Locked on Kraken also about Welcome to the NHL uh, which is the documentary series that they have um, that accounts for that draft with some of the top prospects and that was really exciting to see as uh, a team that had a top four covering a team that had a top four pick. And Shane Wright was one of those players that they followed leading up to the draft. And you heard him say things that he said publicly since, but you know, Oh, can't wait to, you know, I'm going to circle that game. But the one that really I found interesting was when Arizona picked at three, one of the first things you see in the cut is that he says, ah, that one hurt. That one hurts. And I was like, Oh man, you know, he was definitely going through it. And, of course, we also at Locked on Kraken have talked about, is this a bad thing that we get who was supposed to go at one at four? What does that mean? Does he have an attitude problem? Was he glaring at the Montreal, you know, table and stuff like that? And I'm like, 
uh, he would have, I don't know. I think, I don't know. I think that's a little bit uh, sensationalized. I think he definitely was looking at someone. Of course, he's never going to admit that. Uh, was it Montreal? Was it Arizona? I mean, everyone keeps asking if he was looking at Montreal, but maybe he was looking at Arizona. I don't know. Um, but ultimately, what my take on that is, it's not the end of the world. I mean, we have so many really terrible absolutely terrible things that are happening in the hockey community and that are being perpetuated on hockey fans, hockey players in real time that I honestly am not taking a lot of stock or putting a lot of stock in a teenager having an attitude. Oh, right. I was just going to say what 18 year old boy doesn't <laughs> have an attitude problem. Like, yeah. I you know, like what 45 year old dude doesn't have an attitude problem, <laughs> especially like, you know, there, like you said, there are so many bigger issues in this sport. I don't think we need to focus on this kid who w- thought he was going to go number one overall. Exactly. It, it, having, I would be disappointed. Are you kidding me? Of like, I, I'm disappointed when my coffee's made wrong, let alone like my legacy changing. Are you kidding me? Yeah. But, that's just, again, one of the many things that people, one one of the useless things people put stock into in this yeah. sport. But Maddie Beniers and Shane Wright down the middle. What what does that look like, and what does that mean for the future of the of the Kraken organization? Well, we talked about this a lot last season in preparation for the inaugural season, but uh, Ron Francis and basically anyone else in hockey is going to tell you you want to build through the middle, goaltending, defense, centermen. And to get two young, promising centermen, you know, top five picks for sure, obviously both fell within the top four, um, that has a lot of promise. What we also know is that an NHL draft class – can kind of be all over the place, including in those top five, top 10 really picks. It it can be tight for what's, uh, you know, really going to work out for a long hockey career. I think we look at some of the players that have had long careers and we get a little spoiled, but that's the exception and not the rule comparative to who is drafted. So I think it is exciting for sure. There's a lot of promise. And if we trust that the Seattle Kraken have built their staff Um, which I do believe they have to be people who can facilitate growth, then I think, yeah, that's really exciting. Um, But it's uh, as of yet unrealized. So that's where, how long is this process going to take is a little bit of where the discomfort is, I think with Kraken fans. Right. And I think it's fair, obviously to say that it's very realistic and You know, I would be frustrated, too, considering how many years these other teams have had to build their organization. And it's, you know, kind of like a head start. But good things come to those who wait. And coming up next, we are absolutely going to continue the conversation. And uh, before we do that, though, let's talk about our friends at Bet Online. As always, please remember to gamble responsibly. And there are resources out there for you if you are struggling. Bet Online has all your sports betting needs, podcast news, the latest lines, A to Z, real, uh, reality TV bets, everything, golf, you name it, NHL, MLB, and of course, you can find all the details on betonline.net and remember to gamble responsibly. All right. The draft. That that was a lot. How different is this team from what we saw rolled out in October 2021? Yeah, we're extremely different. I mean, we don't have a captain anymore. Um, you know, we we made a lot of moves at the trade deadline. Um, there are even, you know, some players that we lost through waivers um, or through the ra- waiver wire. Um, so it's it's definitely a different squad. Um, it's to be determined. I, th- I think what I would say is that they've definitely gotten better on paper, but we have to remember a lot of the conversation, especially around goaltending about the Seattle Kraken was that they were pretty solid 
on paper. Defensively, we were hearing we're pretty solid on paper. And goaltending and defense are the two areas that light my hair on fire when I have to sit down and get ready for a Locked on Kraken podcast. And I would argue that, that those areas we, I think, I would have liked to see us do a little bit more in those areas in free agency. Absolutely. And, you know, the Flames fans know the first thing about looking good on paper and then falling apart, whether it be in the regular season or the postseason. And I think that's just that's just another part of hockey. Like you can have all the analytics and I test however you want to scout your players. Um the roster on paper can look just so good and competitive and solid, well-rounded, but then they go out there and it just kind of looks like a bunch of baby deer on ice skates or Swiss cheese defense, as I like to call it. Welcome back, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Locked on Flames. And, you know, this has been quite the off-season for the NHL. But I feel like Seattle has had some changes since the trade deadline. What's been going on there? Yeah, well, you know, we got a, a rid of a lot of uh, assets or really more so a lot of money um, at the trade deadline, including our uh, mutual uh, <laughs> in uh, Mark Giordano, our first captain. And that was a move that... It sounds like throughout the season, Geo and, and the Kraken front office had been having that conversation, just kind of seeing how the season was going, um, figuring out what Geo had want would wanted to do and, and stuff like that. So it wasn't a surprise. It's not great when you lose a captain, as we all know. Oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, but needed to be done, needed to be done. Um, and again, did open up some of those assets for the trade. We did move around some of those assets to, to move up um, just a few spots. I believe it was in the second round. Uh, but then also they came in huge when we got Oliver Bjorkstrand yes. in, in particular because the Seattle Kraken being in a good position with our cap space when looking for um, teams that that needed to, to let go of cap space, we – really could um, be in a good position to, to essentially ask for what we wanted. That being said, and it alludes to something I said earlier, I think we could have still been a little bit more aggressive, especially in certain areas like goaltending and defense. But, I mean, same question to you, Jess. I mean, the the Flames were all over NHL Twitter and social media for what was or wasn't going to happen in the offseason. And, of course, some pretty big assets yourself uh, have moved on. Yeah, you know, a free agency opened, and I expected at, like, 12.01, okay, Gaudreau, t- Philly is official, whatever. No, it was, like, 4 o'clock, and he's announced to – Uh, Columbus, which I liked. I thought that was good. Um, Small market, perfect fit for him. Uh, And, you know, with that, you're losing 40 goal scorer. You're losing just one of the best playmakers in the league. And then Matthew Kachuk, a few days later, waltzes in and says, Calgary's not in my long-term picture. Okay. All right. Well, at least you told them now. And that trade gets announced at 11 o'clock at night. And Jonathan Huberto and Mackenzie Weger are suddenly Calgary Flames. Quite the return on that as well, because you get two roster players, a first round pick, and um, a prospect. Now, I don't know what Brad Tree Living's doing. I don't. I have no idea, had no idea, but it was just a crazy week for all of this to be happening. I mean, free agency, I think all over the place has been wild, which all the more reason why I was like, like, can we get in on some of that action? Like, I mean, thinking about uh, the, the Klingberg sweepstakes, Kadri was available. Um, I don't think that goaltending, which again, something that we definitely need was necessarily going to be something that in this free agency that we could really capitalize on. Um, I think we did okay there. 
but what I do like, um, with exception of a handful of contracts, is that the Seattle Kraken basically, um, I would say, got veteran players on bridge contracts. I, I, in my mind, Ronnie Francis came in. He's always got his change going, and he came in and he was like, "Listen, listen, this is how we're gonna do this. You want a team? I've got money to pay you." But we're not keeping it long term. This is a uh, you know short done, short term. Hit it, quit it. We gotta go. You know, um, and yep. if it works out, we'll talk about it. If not, it was nice knowing you. And I think that's fair because, to me, that signals the Seattle Kraken not wanting to be kind of um, handcuffed into certain contracts that are not good contracts. Ron Francis has talked a lot to us in media about listen. We've got these young guys that we really want to give a shot. Then we'll have every shot to make the roster. And then we have to think in the next five or so years of what we want to offer them. If they can do what we say they can do and what everyone projects that they can do, we want money to be able to pay them. So I do think, though, that that leaves us in an interesting position for the next two to three seasons Mm -hmm. because what does that team look like didn't look great as you mentioned coming out of the expansion draft it was projected it would be a lot better than it actually was so i don't really know um and again goaltending we brought in martin jones didn't have a great season i think a lot of people are hoping he can get back to san jose shark numbers um goaltending is hit or miss as we saw with the Seattle Kraken. Uh, we won't have Drieger. He had an ACL, uh, he had an ACL tear um, with his uh, national team, Hockey Canada. Grubauer didn't have a great season. Didn't ever really look comfortable to me um, in front of the Seattle Kraken. We did change up goaltending coaches, so maybe that will help. And then we brought back our, our, our former goaltending coach, and he's in another position. So I don't know what's going on there necessarily. It feels a little like it probably deserves a little more attention than it's getting. But I think that's just because everyone's kind of mums the word and everyone pretty much agrees that the crack in goaltending wasn't great. But, um, you know, again, it just feels like a discomfort. Maybe the ideologies and, and process and system didn't align. Either way, Ron Francis and company moving forward, moving on. And I think it will be a short leash between bridge uh, contracts, but then also with staff, because okay. I do think Ron Francis – wants this to be a winning franchise sooner rather than later. Absolutely. And, you know, I kind of just thought of this while you were talking. Um, Seattle not mimicking Vegas's immediate success doesn't mean they're not going to be a successful team. You know, I think a lot of people kind of are, it's very easy to compare the two because they're the two latest expansion teams. And quite honestly, I would rather be in Seattle's position out of the gate than have this immediate success and then be in a cap space nightmare, not even five years down the road. And that's what we've seen with Vegas. And Ron Francis made it very clear from jump, we are not Las Vegas. They didn't have the luxury of being Las Vegas with the short turnaround between expansion teams. And Cap space is definitely one of the reasons why. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you did mention, if, speaking of caps, Mark Giordano left. So your captain's gone. Do you think that the future captain is currently on the Seattle Kraken's roster? Yeah, I think it's quite possible. A lot of people are calling for Yanni Gord. We still, of course, have Schwartz and Eberly Gord. Um, that all had, um, you know, served as alternate captains. So I think the potential is there. Um, I, I think Gord is a great choice. He's definitely the fan choice. But I, I wonder if it goes to maybe, I wonder if maybe it does go to Schwartzy or Ebbs. I personally would pick Eberly. I think he uh, can really fire people up. You know, that lawnmower is being fired up behind me. But, um, (laughs) you know, I I think he can fire people up. I think he has the respect. I think he has uh, the experience. And uh, obviously he can deliver on the ice. So for my money, if I were a betting woman, uh, and I don't know if Bet Online has these, you know, future future, uh, captain bets, but uh, that would be my take for the Seattle Kraken next captain. (laughs) 
you know, I could absolutely see that. Um, Jordan Eberle was one of my favorite Islanders. That was a very short list, but, you know, he definitely commands respect, I think, throughout the league and in any locker room. Let's but let I want to put you in the hot seat for a minute here. So yeah. we talked a little bit about, you know, just kind of what free agency looked like, but when it comes to leadership for Calgary, I mean, what do you think some of these changes are going to look like when it comes to the chemistry and and what the Flames are going to be able to do in 2022-23? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think a guy like Tyler Toffoli, uh, Chris Tanev, and Jonathan Huberdeau are really, you know, three names that will obviously get the team, like, rally them together. I think that uh, Michael Backlund, who I believe is the longest tenured Flames player, um, he's played his whole career there, um, really just is one of those guys that people turn to. He usually wears an A, but I don't, I don't think that they're going to name a captain this year. I think that they're still going to wait it out, but I definitely think those are some key names in kind of, you know, bringing the team back together and kind of saying, okay, yes, we lost two guys, two big names. We lost more than that, but you know, you have to move forward. We have a, we, the future still bright. The window's there. It's open. It didn't slam shut like a lot of people thought it was going to if Matthew Kachuk and Johnny Gaudreau left. So there's still plenty of reason to be hopeful. Go out there and prove everyone wrong. You're still the underdogs, no matter how you look at it. Yeah, I think that's fair. I do wonder if the Kraken also wait. I do think they have a captain. They have lots of captain material in the locker room, but I do still think that it's an ongoing process and maybe you don't want to lose two captains back to back. I would certainly hope that the likes of an Everly ain't going anywhere anytime soon, but it's the business of the game. So you never know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the thing. Like after spending a few years in, the media and business side of things and like removing myself as a fan. I'm like, yeah, I totally get why players are just so, yeah, this is the business, you know, we just got to keep it going no matter what. Correct. <laughs> Accurate. <laughs> yep. It's, it can be a lot, but coming up next, I figured we could kind of do some more questions and, you know, a hot seat for one another, but uh, make sure you stick around for that. All right, Erica, what do you grade the off season so far? Oh, I'm going with a B minus. And I, um, I also saw that the athletic they've been doing all it may, this is like grades and, you know, uh, charts season, yeah. <laughs> you know, yep. but, um, I saw that they did a, a, a grade report, um, particularly for the contracts they gave at the Seattle mm-hmm. crack at the B minus. I was saying, uh, be- especially before the Ryan Donato re-signing B minus. And that's just because I, I think we made improvements. We should be a better team. Did we buy ourselves 15 more wins? No. It's like averaging out for most experts to maybe about five. I mean, that's better, but it's not great. Um, So B minus in my estimation. I still have a lot of questions in goaltending. I'm just hoping one of the goaltenders gets really hot. And now everyone was like, oh, my gosh, the Kraken are going to be awesome. And then they jinxed us. You know, I'm kidding a little in case you're just listening on audio but you know they (laughs) jinxed us air quotes um and now maybe they'll do a reverse jinx and everyone's like oh the seattle kraken are going to be terrible and then it's like nah well let's see what we got so i say a b minus but how about the flames how are you feeling about what they were able to do you know i would probably say b minus c plus depending on you know i i really want to say a b minus because of the huberdo extension Had that not been done before camp started, I would be very worried because Huberto is a UFA the end of next year, uh, was, and the last thing the Flames needed, the Flames organization, the Flames fan base, anything, they did not need another huge name walking away. 
Uh, a lot of people are disappointed in the the two players who are leaving and saying like, oh, well, Calgary's a great city, you know, like they're taking it personally. Yeah. Um, I, I get it, but also I don't want to shovel my driveway either. Oh, so I would be on the first plane out to Florida, but um, yeah, you know, I think the next big step is kind of working some prospects into things I know that Daryl Sutter doesn't like playing the young guys but it, it's time for some of them to make a jump mm, yeah for sure for sure okay so we talked about grades um any any breakouts you think someone's just gonna have a, a really fantastic season for the Flames and can maybe steal a few wins that aren't projected for this team you know I'm going to say Dylan Dubé and Andrew Mangiapane I it just roots so hard for Dubé. He's a Cal- uh, Calgary kid. He's He has so much more potential in him. And I just, I think that the Flames need to figure out a true role for him. He's not necessarily one of the players that you can just like plug and play anywhere. He needs the consistency, the structure. Um, very much like me. I, I, I can't just, you know, go in and wing it. But I think... It's important for him to be set up for success. Otherwise, you know, he is an RFA at the end of the season. So we're going to have to start looking at things as well. Andrew Mangiapane might as well just change his middle name to Clutch. He is just an absolute force to be reckoned with on power play, penalty kill, even strength. You name it. He scored 35 goals last year, earned himself a nice pay raise. I, I think it's going to be him. I love that. As far as the Seattle Kraken, again, I'm like, eh, I think it's it's minimal improvement from, again, on paper, what we were at the end of last season. But the ex- the more I learn about Oliver Bjorkstrand, the more, ex- or the more excited I am. I think Borokovsky obviously was a pretty big signing for us as well, Andre Borokovsky. But I think Bjorkstrand, to me, sounds more of the, more like the type of player that could really excel and thrive for a Seattle Kraken squad. He spoke to media and he said, listen, I've been with a team that had a lot of young guys and didn't do great. I know what that feels like. I know what's needed. And I asked specifically when you were that young guy, what did some of the veterans do for you that you hope to do for our young centers in particular? And so I really enjoyed hearing his response to that. And again, that veteran leadership, um, coupled with some of the players, like I mentioned, Schwartz, Ebbs, Yanni Gord, that have been there before, Burakovsky. Also, I'm really curious to see what Justin Schultz on the defensive side of things is going to do. I think we need we need more excitement. We need better skating um, and a little bit more of a dynamic type of defenseman. Um, and so I'm not sure exactly how Schultz's game is going to translate comparative to Bjorkstrand's, but I hear good things. Obviously, when you win two cups, you know what that culture is like. You know what it takes. So I'm hoping some of that also rubs off on our blue liners this season. Absolutely. You know, last season, the Flames brought in Blake Coleman, who was just coming off the back-to-back Stanley Cup wins. And something like that is, you know, I kept calling it the shiny new toy. It's just, wow, like this guy knows what it takes. What can I copy and emulate my game? What can I take from him? And I think the biggest thing for the Flames was that two-way defensive forward. And that Mm -hmm. is something that even... Uh, Goudreau, who, you know, 27 years old, set in his ways, you know, can't teach an old dog new tricks. Calling him an old dog at 27 feels so wrong, but that's hockey. Um, You know, will more players be able to bring that into their game? And is there anything you want to see kind of besides the skating? Is there something that you really want to see the Kraken bring in? this season I think again just being a little bit more calm defensively and by our blue liners um I think you know we we put a lot on you know I'd say Alexiak and Larson in particular 
um, and a lot of young guys otherwise. So just really getting that core up. And I think we have, again, Schultz will be able to do that. I think also that just overall the exits and entries were sometimes really brutal to watch for the Seattle Kraken. And to me, that's a little bit more of a mentality thing. These guys have all been playing hockey since they could walk. So it's not that they don't know the game. But for whatever reason, I think sticks were tight, overthinking some things. More movement defensively. I think we had some pretty tall defensive players, which I was really excited about. Generally speaking, I like size defensively. But that didn't always lead to skating ability and skill and moving the puck. I think it's a lot of kind of, uh, you know, football Hail Mary passes to then connect, which I think did make us a weaker team on our entries and exits, not being able to carry the puck through the zones, um, having um, poise and composure with possession from, you know, all three zones, I think was a problem for the Seattle Kraken. And again, really spoke to our exits and entries. I'm also excited um, when you look at, I mean, I mentioned Schultz before, but also, you know, some of our, the other guys that we've brought in and anything, that we can do to improve special teams i am all for it and nut front presence was a little bit of a pro- problem um with us Johnny gord was kind of put into that position a lot i do like ryan donato signing i don't like that he signed for less than morgan geeky i did not understand that i what don't color. understand that at all that to me is just very I don't know. Sus. I I didn't think Ted Donato would let something like that happen, but it was it, I didn't like it. And then you know there were people, there were reports that Donato had higher offers elsewhere, and he wanted to stay with Seattle. I love that Donato is loyal to us. I've been like hardcore. Those who listen to Locked On Kraken, you know, I I have my phrase. We get all this hate from Bruins fans, Wild fans. Sharks fans like, oh, yeah, he seems great. And then he putters out. I was like, no, 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 no. Donato loves us more than he ever loved you. He's going to put on for the Seattle Kraken. And he did. And for them to lowball him, for him to want to stick with us enough that he didn't take, uh, you know, at least what was reported as higher offers. I love that, that he has that loyalty to us. I don't think the Seattle Kraken shared that loyalty, or at least they didn't show it. Um, And so I would love for Ryan Donato to just absolutely crush, have a fantastic season. I mean, it's a one-year deal, so that means we have to go through this with him again. But I I would love for him to just have a fantastic season and really make the Seattle Kraken front office question not only the, the deal that they gave him, but if they're willing to lose him after this coming season. As Someone who went to Ryan Donato's first NHL game and was right behind the net when he scored his first goal. Um, I love this for him. I think that he is, I'm glad that he's found his landing spot in somewhere where he can fit in. Boston has problems developing young players. This isn't a secret. (laughs) And I'm so, I'm just so happy for him. And, you know, I was shocked that Seattle didn't have that pen to paper immediately. Yeah, I I I don't know. I think some of it again was trying to jockey for position and maybe knowing what Donato wanted, knowing that he wanted to stay, they felt that they could make that deal. It seemed like however the negotiations went down with Morgan Geeky, they felt it was a little more urgent to get that deal done. Again, on paper, comparative, but also with my eye test, I would have went all in on Donato over Gigi. So I don't understand it, but I guess maybe maybe uh, they'll both have a great season. I think that would be a win for everyone. But also Petty Me is like, we already know. The answer is Donato. And I don't know why you didn't know that. <laughs> right. No, I completely agree. And I don't. I don't know. Sometimes front offices make decisions like that and you're just kind of like, 
why do you have your why? job? Like, why? why? Yeah, unless there's play somewhere else again, and we, and we can't do necessarily a like for like, um, you know, with those two guys, I think also maybe looking at the positions that they play or that they could potentially play, I guess, in theory, Geeky has a little bit more versatility, air quotes, but um, I just don't think it manifested. It didn't transpire. And Ryan Donato has been a healthy scratch. You know, he's played on a lot of different lines and always brought the energy um, and continued to just showcase what he can do on a team that really didn't have its systems clicking. And so if you need a creator, if you need someone that's a self-starter, Ryan Donato is it. Morgan Geeky struggled to find his way, and we couldn't afford that. Um, a squad that was struggling. I think, you know, Geeky didn't show me that he could kind of play outside of that and make things happen. Donato did. Now, if you're a coaching staff that doesn't like that, then Donato's not your guy. I just don't understand how, in you know, we in in this economy, in this you know, saddle crack in inaugural season economy. I don't really know why Donato is a demerit for us, but you you won't get. I could spend you know five podcasts talking about this and never truly understand it. Like make it make sense. Oh wait, you never will. Like my no. mind is made up. <laughs> no, absolutely, and it's. It's very frustrating, and that's just, again, one of the things about hockey that I will never understand, Um, especially when you're looking for players to, I feel like, take initiative. I I don't know. Maybe that's just, like, my manager side coming out and being like, I want someone to, like, make that first step themselves, but what what do I know? Yeah, and I mean, again, just sometimes that's not what teams want, Um, and that that could be the case. I don't really know for sure, Um, but, you know, I guess, like I said, we'll see. Best case scenario, both perform really, really well. But, uh, you know, uh, of course, whenever we do these squad casts or crossovers, the big question everyone has is, so what does this all mean? What are the bold predictions? What are we expecting? And we both happen to be in the same division. So your team made the playoffs. Mine didn't. Um, so let's let's do this. What do you think uh, or where do you think Calgary will finish in the Pacific Division? And do you think there'll be a playoff squad come the end of the upcoming season? I, I'm i going to say they finish third in the division okay. um, behind Edmonton and whoever else is in first. But I will say that they make the playoffs. I think they have a slow start to the season trying to figure out the chemistry, chemistry get all – you know, uh, the Pistons firing, getting everything, just everyone on the same page, in the same book, the same paragraph, the same line, the same word, which we've seen them struggle with in the past. But I do think that they make the playoffs. I don't know if it's a successful playoff run, but we'll get there eventually. Mm-hmm. What about you? Yeah, this is interesting because I think everyone in the Pacific Division is chasing, as you mentioned, Edmonton, Calgary. I think – um the Kings are an interesting team. Um, I haven't, I can't say that I'm, I'm fully versed in what um, their off season moves have been, but the trajectory I think is moving in a positive direction. So I still think that, you know, we're, we're chasing those, those three teams, yourself included. Um, so that makes it really tough. I think we could probably, jockey for maybe that five or six spot which would not put us in the playoffs and I do think that that's accurate and fair for what the improvements have been made did we gain some wins yes did we gain enough to be more competitive in the Pacific Division I think also yes does that mean we're going to be a playoff team in our second season right now my answer is no (laughs) And, you know, that's kind of the fun part is that we get to make these predictions in the first week of August and then circle back to them in a few months and (laughs) then just pretend they never existed. Um, (laughs) But thank you so much for joining me today, Erica. Where can people find you, your show, and all your work? 
Yeah, thank you so much. And I hope you enjoyed the uh, soundscapes from the landscaping that happened on the show today. But yes, you can find me, of course, over at Locked on Kraken. We are your daily Seattle Kraken podcast. We're on social media at Locked on Kraken, all one word. You can find me personally at elindsay08 on social media. That's E-L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-0-8. Perfect. And thank you so much for joining me and go listen to Locked on Kraken for some more soundscapes of America. (laughs) 